Thank you, Otto Vardin. That was a lovely introduction. You did give part of my talk, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to look at you all first. <laughs> okay, so um, so I suppose really this is an example of how. Uh, people who work together very closely can be very different. So Art of Arden's talk yesterday was very Art of Arden. Very, very deep and meaningful and spot on, dharmically. Uh, mine's very actual, Shraddha. <laughs> um, and tomorrow I'm sure Vishanka's talk will be very Vishanka. But we work very closely as a team, but we are quite different in some ways. So my, my memory of us being given these talks was that um, so Art of Arden said yesterday was given the title and, and I remember it as um, when we were discussing this I remember saying I'll do the one on friendship <laughs> I, think I, I think I chose it <laughs> So first of all I'll give you an overview of what's going to happen So I'm going to start off um, with part of the quote from why I am a Buddhist that I'm going to focus on then I'm going to uh, read a story from the Buddha's life. And these two that I'm going to start with are ideals. They're something to aspire to. Yeah. And then I'm going to talk, so I'm going to give you some personal stories. Um, personal stories and um, yeah, and me having the Dharma as the foundation for my life, really. And, and, I'll, explore, and I'll explore moving towards ideals, the ideal of friendship. And I want to highlight that as human beings, we have strengths and we have weaknesses. Um, so we have strengths that need to be developed and can be developed. And we have our challenges and our messiness that we can transform and grow from. Um, hopefully I'll highlight that we are a work in progress. Um, and I'll look a little bit at how we aspire to living out the, the quote that I'm going to read out. So the quote that I'm going to focus on is, I believe that it is possible for any human being to communicate with any other human being, to feel for any other human being, to be friends with any other human being. So I'm going to be focusing on that part of the quote. So I'm now going to um, say a little bit about um, a story from the Buddha's life. So there were three monks who lived and practiced together. Anaruddha, Nandia and Kimbala. And um, one day the Buddha went to visit them. When I was thinking about that bit, I thought, wow, just imagining the Buddha coming to visit you. Wow, what must that have been like? So the Buddha went to visit these three monks. And he asked them, are you living diligent, ardent and resolute in other words so in other words you're saying are you striving for spiritual progress and Anna Rudda confirmed that they were doing that and uh, this is what Anna Rudda said venerable sir as to that whichever of us returns first from the village with alms food prepares the seats sets out the water for drinking and for washing and puts the refuge bucket in its place Whichever of us returns last eats any food left over if he wishes. Otherwise he throws it away where there is no greenery or drops it into water where there is no life. He puts away the seats and the water for drinking and for washing. He puts the away the refuge bucket after washing it and he sweeps out the refectory. Whoever notices that the pots of water for drinking, washing or the latrine are low or empty takes care of them. If they are too heavy for him, he calls someone else by a signal of the hand and they move it by joining hands. But because of this, we do not break out into speech. But every five days, we sit together all night discussing the Dharma. This is how we abide, diligent, ardent and resolute. So that's an ideal of living together. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I have occasionally had that experience on retreat where everybody's working together. You get the sense of the, that presence of the Anarudas. So 
So I want to explore some ways of moving towards those ideals. Um, so I'm going to start off with three personal stories and three friendships. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to talk about my best friend. Okay. So my best friend's called Donna Samudra. Um, and I'm hoping that this will highlight uh, the, an example of how it is possible to change. Okay. So going back to when I first arrived through the door um, of, a, of the Blackburn Buddhist Centre, it was in 1994. Okay, and I actually had quite a small life. I had a, it felt like a small life. I went to work, I went to the pub. That was about it, really. Um, apart from it was slightly expanding because um, I was also I was also training to be a yoga teacher. There's a bit of an oxymoron in there, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> so gradually, 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 my life was expanding to meet more people. But um, interestingly, out of Arden mentioned about my particular background, and I have a working class background. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, it was quite a small life, and I, I had a small range of friends, if you will. And what I remember is that we had our prejudices, and we were very vocal <coughs> about our prejudices. And I was vocal about my prejudices. So in the, in the UK, we do have the class-based system, don't we? Um, and with my quite strong conditioning, I felt that I wouldn't be able to, or couldn't, or didn't want to relate to people who I would assume were of a higher class than I was. Yeah? I felt distant from them. I'd, put a, I'd actually put a barrier up, because I thought, well, we'll not relate anyway. I'll put this barrier up. So um, there was this little me in here with my views and my stuff going on. And then there was everybody else out there. And particularly that barrier was in relation to people who I thought were, well, I had this thing <laughs> to think about, um, that I wouldn't be able to relate to people who were a bit posh, meaning people from a different, higher class than me. Okay. Uh, little did I know that that was going to be challenged quite strongly. Okay, so back to the quote, I believe it is possible to be friends with any other human being, yeah. And what I find is, is that prejudice was stopping me doing that. Well, this was a very, this is years and years, decades of thinking about this. Now, so in Tree Ratna, we're very fortunate that we've got the emphasis on friendship, yeah. And that encouragement to actually engage with other human beings, to engage, to talk to, to get to know people, uh, to work at it, yeah. I can guarantee that I would not have met my best friend if it wasn't for Tree Ratner, yeah. Um, So going back, to that going back to that first connection that we had, so we met in 2008 on a retreat at Team Atna Loka. And I remember, as I, you know, you, you have these, you have memories, don't you, they're really vivid. And it's a vivid memory. We sat next to each other and we had a five minute conversation. And, and that was it really. I thought, oh, I know this woman. <laughs> I knew her. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I gradually got to know her. And it's, it's really interesting, those barriers, with knowing her, those barriers have gone. You know, that barrier between there's a me in here and there's somebody who's a different class to me out there. It's totally gone. I'm, I totally relate differently now. Um, so you have, um, you have your peer friendships, don't you? So we call it horizontal friendships. You have people who are at the same sort of spiritual progress as you. And so, so Donna Smudra's a, a peer friend, we're horizontal friendships, have horizontal friendships. And we got ordained together. So on our ordination retreat, we shared a room for three months and we're still best friends. That's good. <laughs> it was really funny. So on the retreat, on the retreat, <laughs> people found it really amusing because we are so different. Yeah, we are so different. Uh, on all levels, so educationally we're different, our sexuality are different, our career paths, our social class. So her parents were both in the medical profession and very specialised and high up in their profession. Yeah. 
and she lived in a mansion. <laughs> so she showed me a picture of a house she grew up in. Really? <laughs> And uh, my parents worked in factories, so my dad uh, made television screens, Philips, and my mum made hacksaw blades. So, yeah, so we were different. <laughs> but by the, end of our, um, by the end of our ordination retreat, we were finishing each other's sentences and thinking the same thing at the same time. Um, so it's a learning curve. I think, to, for me, really, what it highlighted was the ridiculousness of my prejudice. How completely ridiculous that prejudice was. Yeah. Um, and I've really learned through that. And yeah, yeah. I think really it's a little victory. I'm a big fan of rejoicing in small victories. So yeah, the, the third lectionary is, um, is that we have that that um, belief that we have uh, a fixed self. Yeah? And for me, that learning about my prejudices and trying to soften that, trying to soften that barrier, is just a <coughs> tiny insight into that, into that third lakshana of believing in a fixed self. Okay, so my, the second friendship I want to talk about is my friendship and I do have a friendship with my, par my, with my preceptor, my private preceptor. Um, so my preceptor is Parami. Um, and I'm, I, I met her in 2004 on a retreat. And again, it was, <coughs> interestingly, it was that immediate connection. Uh, she was giving a talk on, on Meta, and I remember thinking, uh, I want to have this woman in my life. So I went on all her retreats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, if she, was, if she was leading the retreats, I was on it, basically. Um, so I was talking about horizontal friendship. There's also a vertical friendship. So we have a friendship, but she's also my preceptor. I also look up to her a lot. Yeah? She exemplifies living the Dharma life. So Artavardin has just said... <laughs> quite moving actually when you said about I live the Dharma life and I just give myself to it. Well that's because of Paramis, the exemplification of Parami. Yeah, because she has given her whole life, her whole, the whole of her adult life at the service of the Dharma. She has just put herself at the service of the Dharma and of Bhante. And I've had the very great privilege to have been able to see that, to see that in action. Um, and I have seen her just totally give of herself. Yeah? And if I can do a little bit of that, I'd be, you know, I'd be happy, really. And <laughs> Artavardin also said the Dharma is caught and not taught, um, which is true. I caught the Dharma from Parami. Yeah? So we have, we have a, a deep connection, um, and, I, and I trust her completely. I know that if I... Uh, if I, if I um, if I need to share anything with her, I can just do that. I know I can just do that. Yeah, um, and I suppose my relationship with Parami is a call to practice. Yeah. Um, and even the Buddha wanted something to look up to when he gained enlightenment. And I do think it's important in life to have someone to look up to, someone who has lived the Dharma life, who, who you can't aspire to be like. And I think with that, with Parami, it is like that. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, she told me that she was proud of me. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> and I thought, that makes me very happy indeed. Very happy indeed. So the next friendship I want to talk about is um, going back to the talk, uh, going back to the quote, I believe it is possible to communicate with any other human being, to feel for any other, other human being, and to be a friend with any other human being. Uh, and I just want to highlight a little bit that is, I believe it is possible to feel for any other human being, because sometimes we have blind spots and we get it wrong. Yeah, we get it wrong. 
um, we make mistakes and um, and sometimes it it's it's good to have that brought to your attention yeah so sometimes in our communication in our connection with other people um, we can cause harm and um, a number of times recently I seem to have I seem to have had a little run recently of miss what I call missing people yeah I've missed people but I just haven't quite I've been too concerned with what's happening for me what I'm doing next yeah I've been self-absorbed and I have missed someone yeah so I've fallen short a lot of this ideal yeah um, and that's happened quite a number of times recently um, there was one occasion where I caught it in the moment I was fast enough to caught, catch it in the moment and I apologised in the moment um, but there's been another one so here I'm going to talk about my friendship with Bridie and my gratitude to Bridie yeah. um, because Bridie was brave enough to say to me we need to have a conversation yeah. Um, so bearing in mind I'm the Mitra convener and I hold a particular role in the centre but Bridie to actually say that just showed a lot of courage and a lot of authentic, uh, she was authentic yeah. um, so I've been too quick to act and to speak in, in, in a number of incidents actually and I've broken the pr first precept yeah, I had caused harm um, and Bridie, we had, we had a chat and she was courageous, she was honest, she was appropriate, she was authentic in her feedback. She was calm, yeah. So I'd been unskillful in my actions and Bridie was completely skillful in her communication with me. She was kind, she was open and she just articulated what I'd done, yeah. Um, and I had caused harm. And, and actually, it's, I feel such gratitude to you, Bridie, yeah, for articulating that and telling me what I'd done. Um, and I would, hope that, um, I would hope that I would be able to put in a little pause before I acted or spoke like that again. Yeah. Um, it's, it is a learning curve. It is a gift. If somebody gives you feedback like that, it's a gift. Yeah, and I think it's important to hear them. Yeah, if somebody says that they uh, they want to give you some particular feedback like that, hear them because they're doing it for a reason. Yeah, um, and give them space for them to speak. Yeah, um, yeah. So I had to own my unskillfulness. Um and acknowledge and honour Bridie's communication with me. So, yeah, yeah. So what happened next? Well, so I had to acknowledge what she said. I had to own that. Um, and what she said was completely true. It was completely accurate, yeah. But then what happened was I experienced shame. So in the Abhidharma, there are 51 mental events. 11 of them are positive <laughs> mental events. And shame is one of the positive mental events. Yeah. And I did experience shame. So I'm going to read you a quote from this book, Mind in Harmony by Sabuti. It talks about faith as well and shame are linked. To have faith is to have a sense of the good, a sense of how a human being should live and act. In short, it is to have values. If you have a measure of faith in your heart, you will, when you fall short of those values, as you sometimes must, feel ethical disquiet. In everyday language, you will feel shame. To feel shame is to feel uncomfortable. This may be a definite physical sensation. You may blush and feel hot. You may want to avoid meeting other people's eyes. If you experience such uncomfortable feeling in connection with shame, it is worth prizing because it is a guardian. It will prevent you from acting unskillfully. 
because you won't want to experience that discomfort. As a result of cultivating that painful consciousness, you are thus protected from acting unskillfully, and when you do so, you are impelled to put it right, to make amends for what you have done. Yeah. So uh, I, th I think shame, yeah, is a guardian. Yeah. It's if you feel that, learn from it, because you can move on from it. Yeah. And you can um, you can change from it. You can apologise. You can act differently. Yeah. You could ask for forgiveness. Okay, so what I've mentioned here are three supports to learning. Um, learning about yourself, learning about how to connect with another human being. So the first one is that awareness of um, there's a me in here and there's an everybody else out there and there's a barrier there. And, and, and just finding ways to soften that barrier, to make it more permeable. Yeah, to move through that barrier. Yeah, it's not all about me. Yeah. Um. It's a real false. It's a real. It's a false view. Yeah. It stops you connecting. Um. The second is the precepts owning our unskillfulness. Um. We've, we're, we're to practice the precepts all the time, of course. And also I mentioned having somebody to look up to, somebody to aspire to, yeah, somebody to aspire to be like. Um, so another support for learning how to feel for, communicate or be friends with any other human being is the meta bhavna. Um, pro really obvious, yeah, but let's keep coming back to the meta bhavna, it's vital. Uh, Meta, Meta does enable us to connect with our human solidarity. I think Sila Bordi mentioned human solidarity yesterday in the Meta Bhavna. Uh, all beings want to be well and want to be happy. So I was thinking about the Meta Bhavna and, uh, and then I thought, okay, um, what shall I say about the Meta Bhavna? So my go-to person is Visantra. I'm a big fan of Visantra. Um, and this little book, little, little book, The Heart, by Visantra, uh, I went to this book to think, okay, what can I say about metal? Um, and in that book, he talks about feelings and volitions. Okay, so our feelings are anything in us that uh, are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Okay. Um, so I'll just say a little example thing. Um, so our feelings are calm, uh, our feelings are pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Our volitions are what happens next. Yeah. So let's imagine, for instance, that you're in the second stage of the metabhavna. You sat on your cushion. You're meditating. You're in the second stage of the metabhavna. You bring your good friend to mind. You drop into your heart and there's a pleasant sensation in your heart, okay? And what the volition, the what happens next, the action that happens next is you wish your friend well, yeah? And that, because you've already got a warm sensation, yeah, a pleasant sensation, whatever that may be, it's a bit easier, yeah? It's easier to, for that volition to come into, come into action, if you will. Okay, so you can relate to that, can't you? You think of your good friend, you wish them well. So say you're in the fourth stage of the metabhavna and you bring to mind somebody that you're having a little bit of difficulty with. So you bring that person to mind and you drop into what you're feeling in your heart and it might be actually that you have a little, a little resistance in your heart which feels a little bit unpleasant. So at that point, you notice the unpleasantness. That's just unpleasant. Feelings are just what they are. Yeah. But then you have a choice. Yeah. So you. So the choice is actually there might be some aversion comes in. Yeah. The emotional aspect might be a little bit of an aversion. But you also have that choice where you can really, you can really sort of work to 
wish well. Yeah, okay, I've got that unpleasant sensation. I'm aware of that, but I will wish them well. All beings want to be well and happy. So you can do that on your cushion, but I was thinking, well, you could also do that anytime. You could do that anytime in your connections with people. Um, so your volition is your intention to consciously lead your energy in a particular direction. Yeah. So you could do that in the moment, really. So you could do that when you're chatting to people. So if you're aware of your, uh, if you're aware of the feeling tone, you can then consciously act, if you will, to connect. Does that make sense? <coughs> it's something you can do in the moment. Yes, yeah, so I'd recommend Meta as a way of connecting. So I've been giving the examples I've given are um, examples from within Tree Ratna, if you will, from being friends with someone within Tree Ratna. And obviously, we've got spiritual friendship as a, as a real overt context. Uh, so some, in some ways, it may be easier because you're both relating on the same. Uh, you're both on the same path people that you're talking to, and you all want to change and develop. But what about those people that we feel really challenging, feel really challenging? Um, so what about the people who, who, who commit extreme acts of violence, for instance? What about them? What about particularly politicians and world leaders? No names mentioned. Um, so I want to really acknowledge that, yeah, that is a tall order. <coughs> that is a tall order. So what I'm, what I'm giving you today is a starting point. It's a starting point. So I've given you little pointers. And that when I'm, when I'm teaching beginners the Metta Bhavna, I always say, um, start with that person who niggles you a little bit in the fourth stage. Yeah. Don't go for the biggie. Yeah, the decades old conflict how can you <coughs> climb Mount Everest if you can't climb up Oyster Hill yeah it's not doable <laughs> but just keep practicing just keep practicing yeah and yeah we may or may not be able to communicate feel for be friends with all human beings it is an aspiration yeah So at this point in proceedings, what I was going to do is give a whole big spiel about uh, how to communicate with any other human being and go all the things about how to communicate and, all, and then I changed my mind. Um, so what I'm going to do is just direct you to this book, um, Thicker Than Blood by Maitreya Bandhu, which gives a whole chapter on how to communicate with people, friends. So I'll direct you to that because what happened last night when I was listening to um, Elizabeth's lovely talk is Elizabeth talked about Suryaka coming and standing by her side at the bookshop now we can all do that we can all do that so what I'm going to do is talk about communicating with people who come into the Buddhist centre yeah, because we have no idea what's brought people through the door of the Buddhist centre. They may have been stood outside for half an hour, debating whether to walk through the door of this big, big building in the middle of Manchester city centre. We have no idea. Yeah. So Suryaka standing by Elizabeth's side. Any of us can do that. Any of us can do that. So what that led me to was thinking about, so the next person I thought about was Artiketu. So when Artiketu left to um, move to Germany, we had a number of gatherings for him, um, for his send-offs, yeah. And it was interesting to see the number of people who said to Artiketu, you were the first person who spoke to me 
when I walked through that door. And as they were, tr as they were talking, they had tears rolling down their face. Yeah? You just don't know what effect you will have. Yeah? And then I thought about Bridie. So on a Tuesday, Bridie comes in to help make the Buddhist Centre beautiful, help make the Shrine Room beautiful. And she does a lot more than that. Bridie speaks on the ground floor. Bridie speaks to everybody who walks through our ground floor when she's in the building. And I've seen her do that. <coughs> yeah. And that is, yeah, who knows what effect that's having. Who knows how many people will have been affected by that. Yeah? And come back next week because of that. Book on a course because of that. Yeah. So we can do that for newcomers and we can do it for each other. So last week, Seela Bordy in the trustees meeting was reminiscing about his Mitra ceremony. <laughs> Weren't you? Uh, <laughs> and one of the things he said was he remembers vividly his Mitra ceremony. And he remembers how many order members were in the room, order members that he'd never met before. Yeah. And sometimes people say to me, oh, I won't go to that event because I don't know them. Well, we're a big sangha. We're a big sangha. Yeah. And the way that you get to know people is to turn up. <laughs> yeah. When you turn up, you'll get to know people. Yeah. So, uh, so think, thinking about what Seela Bordy was saying, so I was thinking, okay, so there were order members in the room who will have gone up to him afterwards and said, oh, hello, Anne, whoever, um, welcome to the Mitra Sangha. And there'll have been Mitras training for ordination in the room who will have gone up to him afterwards and said, oh, hello, Anne, whoever. Yeah. And there'll have been Mitras in the room and he was joining the Mitra Sangha. Yeah. So there's that standing alongside again, yeah? The Mitra Sangha is standing alongside you as you join that community. Yeah, and they'll be they're friends and family, of course. Um, now it does take effort. Um, it does take effort to do this, and you do have to keep practicing. We are a work in progress, aren't we? Um, but people who have been practicing for longer, more experienced members of the Sangha, can exemplify and share their practice with those who are less experienced in the Sangha. And we do that by being there. Yeah? Uh, there's always opportunities to exemplify friendship. Always. Um, and I was thinking about this fabulous little brochure that uh, Louise uh, designed. Okay, so at the back of this little brochure, there's all our opportunities. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. There's all our opportunities for doing what I've just been talking about. Yeah. So next Monday, the 29th of April, we have a send-off. So Linda, Linda Taylor, um, did live in Manchester many years ago and then went to live in Cardiff and she's come back to Manchester because she's got like, Man like a stick of Blackpool rock. She's got Manchester through the middle of her. And um, so not everybody will know Linda because she's only just come back from being away and uh, it being, it's spending time in Cardiff. But how fantastic if everybody in this room was there next Monday. What would that say to Linda? What would that say to us, all of us as a community? Yeah, we're a Manchester Sangha, we're practising together. Yeah, we've met the Dharma. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? Yeah. And then on, I'm just going to advertise now. Sorry. <laughs> this is segued into an advertisement. Okay. On the 13th of May, we get to rejoice in our fabulous chairman. Yeah. And and we get to welcome and rejoice in our new chairman to be, see the border. Yeah. So Artavardin will be leaving and Seela Bordy will be joining us as chair. I expect the room to be full. <laughs> um, and then during the week, so this is a full week, so the week beginning the 13th of May is a full week, people. Get it in your diaries now. 
every day that week. Either myself or Vishanka will be leading a puja in the run-up to Buddha Day. If the Buddha hadn't sat underneath the Bodhi tree all those years ago in Bodhgaya, we wouldn't be in this room. We wouldn't know each other. Would we? Let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that. So I, I have a little, I have an iPod that I inherited from my late partner and it's got all of Banty's talks on the iPod and I've decided to listen to them in alphabetical order which is rather random <laughs> I have to say <laughs> but I was listening to a talk from 1965 so this talk started with Mr Humphreys and friends <laughs> okay <laughs> well he's obviously giving a talk to Christmas Humphreys and people <laughs> and and he was saying in the UK, when we celebrate, in inverted commas, Buddha Day, it's all a little bit dry. <laughs> um, and he was saying, he was saying um, how important the festivals are. Yeah, Buddha Day is our Christmas. Yeah, how much fuss, think about this, how much fuss do you make of Christmas? Do you make that much fuss of Buddha Day? Are we just dropping that in? <laughs> <laughs> and then on the 19th of May, it's Buddha Day. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to be too much, we don't want to be too high energy. Yeah. Because um, it's not frothy and fluffy, isn't Buddha Day? There's also a depth to it as well, yeah? There's a depth to it. The Buddha gained enlightenment and said, it is possible for you to do this as well, yeah? It is possible for you to do this, yeah? So I, f I feel really fortunate that I've got this context where I can learn. I can learn about myself with all my messiness and all my ups and downs and all my fabulousness and all my victories. So whenever you um, notice one of your victories, you need to rejoice in your victories. Um, we need to make effort. The Dharma life isn't... Uh, isn't um, easy sometimes. Actually, Banti has said that the Dharma life, the spiritual life, is not easy. Yeah, you have to make action. You have to make effort. You have to own your own actions. You have to keep practicing, studying, meditating, practicing the precepts, developing your friendships. So coming back to the Anuruddhas, the three monks who lived in complete harmony together. We have that as an ideal and we can move towards that, yeah? And we can do that together as a, as a Sangha and as a community. And we can expand on that ideal and, be, and there is that possibility that we can communicate with, feel for and be friends with any human being. Thank you.